Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm really excited to talk to you um, about one of my dissertation chapters. I decided just to focus on, on one chapter and um, momentarily I'll be sharing my screen with you so that you can see um, a presentation and see a lot of the art that I've put together for you to see today. Um, I wanted to start by just kind of telling you a story. I'm going to um, read you a story that um, comes from my writing. So this is it. In 1967, art historian and theologian Jane Dillenberger visited abstract expressionist painter Mark Rothko in order to see a series of canvases that were to be installed in a chapel in Houston, Texas. Of course, this chapel would become the Rothko Chapel that is still visited and um, being upkept and well-loved in Houston, Texas. There were 14 panels, one for each station of the cross. The meeting between artist and historian was quiet and understated. According to Dylan Berger's own account, she felt drawn to the massive canvases, calling them darkly luminous. Initially, she just looked a they just looked awash with nondescript dark color, but upon inspection, she noticed that they were in fact made up of a variety of modulated dark tones, including blues and mahoganies. Later, she wrote in her journal, I felt as if my eyes had fingertips moving across the brushed textures of the canvases. Then she cried right there in Rothko's apartment, but did not know why. She recounted that she had very strange feelings, including relief, perfect ease, pure peacefulness, and joy. This experience is not unlike what happens to many viewers when viewing the color field paintings of Rothko. Indeed, he said, those people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. The San Francisco Modern Art Museum reports that it is not unusual for visitors to stop in their tracks and stare at his paintings. They report that crying is not uncommon. Yet other patrons walk by barely noticing them. Why do Rothko's paintings make people feel so strongly? So that's just an introduction um, to, to what I'd like to talk to you about today. Okay. All right, so what I wanted to talk to you today is um, about how art can be a gateway to spiritual experience. Um, and it's going to be um, a little bit of a different approach because I'm going to attempt to uh, combine two elements. And those two elements um, are, they might seem uh, <laughs> not complementary, but they really are. So we're going to talk about two things and their complementary roles. One is art that you can experience or an experience that results from interacting with art. And art itself, that is particularly embodied or emphasizes the physical. Um, and these two things are complementary because when you can experience art, you have to experience it through a physical presence. There's a frame, there's a painting, um, depending on the art, you might see brush strokes of the artist, all those kinds of things. And some of the words that we use to describe um, art as experience are phenomenology. Um, is phenomenology, it's a great word, but basically it's the study, it's a 20th century um, philosophical approach that looks as personal experience as a way to have truth or to know truth or to understand something better. Um, there's a great deal of overlap between the aesthetic and spiritual communication when we're talking about phenomenology. And what's interesting about phenomenons or when phenomena or when we talk about having personal experiences, very often those are personal and vary from person to person, yet that doesn't negate their truth or their importance. Um, for art that is particularly embodied, we're talking um, that we're talking about the fact that we have to experience art through its physical nature. Um, from a theological viewpoint, many of the artists that we're looking at today also uh, have it almost the art as a stand-in um, or symbolic of the incarnation. Because we're going to look at a Christian artist particularly who believes this, where you have to have something tangible or something physical to grasp onto. And to acknowledge also 
Um, kind of an analogical worldview uh, that is typical of um, Catholics particularly, and I think also friendly to that Latter-day Saint view, which is that we can see spiritual implications and even worldly, or, or not, not worldly things, that has a bad connotation, but um, natural things. Um, every aspect of living, we don't necessarily have to bifurcate our lives into spiritual and secular. A lot of times those things overlap. And I think that's a pretty comfortable place for Latter-day Saints to be. All right. Another thing to acknowledge is that um, the kind of knowledge that we can get out of art is a very important dimension of knowledge. And I have this great quote from um, an education researcher, Randy Lawrence, and she says, um, learning is a holistic process that involves cognitive, affective, somatic, and spiritual dimensions. The arts naturally engage us in all of these learning domains. So if you haven't heard of somatic, that just means with your body, um, through your actual body. Affective um, is often kind of um, put in contrast to things that we know through more concrete means. Affective might be through your feelings. And so that's what she's saying is that the arts naturally engage all of these things. Yet, she continues, emotional embodied ways of knowing are often dismissed and ignored because they are often viewed as lesser than lesser than quantifiable, concrete, and scientific ways of knowing. And that's very typical for our world today that um, the kind of knowledge that we gain through an emotional experience is often not given as much credence as something um, you know, scientific. And obviously, we're going to treat different modes of knowledge and communication depending on the field. But just because this involves feeling and in regards to the arts doesn't mean it's a lesser way of knowing, it's just a different way of knowing. But we wouldn't necessarily apply that to science. Like we wouldn't be like, I feel this about science and that wouldn't fly, right? So we have different ways of communicating in different fields. Um, and just to remind you, I, I do think this really does feel familiar to the Latter-day Saint population. I don't think I'm saying anything crazy here. And just in my reading from uh, Come Follow Me this last week, I picked up several things. And obviously, this is not exhaustive. This is just to kind of remind us um, that we learn our own testimonies very often through very personal experiences. And those personal experiences can vary a lot from person to person. So, um, did I not speak peace to your mind from DNC six? I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost. If it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. All right, that's just from one section of Doctrine and Covenants. And we can go on with uh, commiserate passages from the Bible and, and also from the Book of Mormon. But here's Down Oaks. He said, this has been one of my favorite quotes that I've used in a lot of classes, because it raises our spirits and helps us resist evil and seek good. I believe that the feeling of uplift that is communicated by reading the scriptures or by enjoying wholesome music, art, or literature is a distinct purpose of revelation. And, and I think it's important to point out that for a lot of us, especially those of us who have particularly um, strong aesthetic sensibilities or very sensitive to visual or musical communication, that might be one of the primary ways that we experience spiritual revelation. And that might be different than our spouse or our parents or brothers or sisters, and that's okay. Um, because the spirit will speak to us individually. And just, I just encountered this, uh, this last month, I have the little book Daily Joy by President Nelson. It's a, and he said on one day, music has power to facilitate worship. It allows us to contemplate the atonement and the restoration of the gospel with its saving principles and exalting ordinances. So I, I hope this feels familiar. And this is just a touch, of course, I, we could have a whole discussion on um, Latter-day Saint theology and how aesthetics and um, feelings that we get by interacting with the arts overlap into spiritual experiences. But I just wanted to reference that I think it's a pretty familiar feeling. All right, so let's translate that. Um, and, and obviously, please, if you have questions, um, just feel free. And I may not see it. Let's see, I don't know if the chat's enabled or not, but um, just someone, Shannon or whoever, um, you can tell me if there's a question, but I'll try and have some question time at the end too, um, if you'd like to go there. 
All right, so let's translate what I just was talking about kind of in our own um, spiritual language to um, the philosophy of this. And the philosophy of this is called phenomenology. And this is um, harnessing the power of firsthand personal experiences as a way to understand truth. Um, this was a huge difference in the understanding of aesthetics that happened mostly in the 20th century. Very different from the Kantian kind of objective, disinterested view um, of the artistic object. This is very different. This is personal and um, trying to get to the bottom of why art affects us so much. Um, Stephen Crowell, who has done a lot of work in phenology, phenomenology, he says, of all philosophical approaches to aesthetics, it is phenomenology that best accounts for why art matters to us. Phenomenology uncovers the meaning of art. And John Dewey, in his classic, In Art and Experience, says, aesthetic experience is always more than aesthetic. He's saying just having a pure aesthetic experience that doesn't reach into the emotional or spiritual domain doesn't exist. And, and I agree. Um, I think whenever we have a profoundly aesthetic experience, it's not only aesthetic, it has done something else to us. And that can be very, very meaningful. All right, a couple other quotes just to kind of get us um, in the mode to understand this. Um, this is a wonderful quote from a great um, 20th century philosophical work called Truth and Method by Hans Georg Gadamer. And Gadamer was basically one of the forerunners to assert that art has its own truth claim, that independent of anything else, the object itself and how it stands for what the artist was saying has a truth claim that, that is unique and different and, and different in a way um, that still has meaning for viewers over time. It's a, it's a great concept. So this is what he says. Is there to be no knowledge in art? Does not the experience of art contain a claim to truth, which is certainly different from that of science, but justice certainly uh, is not inferior to it? And is not the task of aesthetics precisely to ground the fact that the experience of art is a mode of knowledge of a unique kind, certainly different from that sensory knowledge which provides science with the ultimate data from which it constructs the knowledge of nature, and certainly different from all moral rational knowledge, and indeed from all conceptual knowledge, but still knowledge, meaning conveying truth? So he's saying this is really important that art, art has its own truth claim. And by the way, really long sentence, typical of those German philosophers. <laughs> so when they get translated, they're just these outrageously long sentences. Okay, and then John Dewey, um, he goes on to say, if all meanings could be adequately expressed by words, the arts of painting and music would not exist. There are values and meanings that can be expressed only by immediately visible and audible qualities. And to ask what they mean and the sense of something that can be put into words is to deny their distinctive existence. Now, I don't think he's saying we shouldn't try to discuss our experiences with art, but he's saying they cannot be reduced to linguistic expression only. They have something else about that that sometimes is even hard to talk about. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but that there's a dimension that is deeper than just saying something in words. All right, um, and just a couple more thoughts here. Um, to experience art again and again is to make it both new and personal. And I love this concept about art. John Dewey continues, interaction with old material creates something new. Every work of art is recreated every time it is aesthetically experienced. Love that idea. So you go see Michelangelo's David in the Academia in Florence. You've never seen it before. The experience you have it with it is absolutely unique, yet it can also be added to the world experience of all of the other viewers throughout time who have viewed that work. And in a way, it kind of stands together in this really deep and emotional way. And you may have had an experience where you saw an old work of art where you could almost feel the love and appreciation that people have given it over time. Perhaps you felt that going into a cathedral or experiencing something like that. Gadamer says something similar. He says, all encounter with the language of art is an encounter with an unfinished event and is itself a part of this event. The experience of art, art acknowledges that it cannot present the full truth 
of what it experiences in terms of definite knowledge. There is no absolute progress and no final exhaustion of what lies in a work of art. The experience of art knows this of itself. So basically he's saying that as we view this work of art, we're adding more and more experiences and making this art continually relevant throughout time, adding our experience to all those who have viewed it in the past and that it's not exhausted. Someone else is going to come in and look at this art and have a unique experience themselves. And that's a really exciting thing about art is that you can't say it's done. No one, it will speak to no one else ever again. And it's said all it can say, because that's not the nature of art. The nature of art thrives in the experience of the viewer. All right, one more um, philosophical uh, kind of, a, I guess a few more words I'm gonna throw out at you. Um, ontical and ontological. Maybe some of you have heard these words if you've taken some philosophy classes, but it's kind of um, basically words we use to describe um, how we learn things. Ontical usually refers to the physical, the tangible, factual, tends to be non-religious, kind of one-dimensional, kind of obvious in some ways, um, and it must be experienced with the body. That, that's how we do it. Now, ontological reality is metaphysical. It encompasses the spiritual and religious uh, domains. Um, it contemplates the nature of being. It asks us questions, who am I? What am I? Where am I going? What is my purpose? All those kinds of things. It's more complex and it's understood abstractly. The cool thing about art is that it uses ontical reality, the actual art object itself, as it exists in physical space to communicate ontological reality. So we can use the art to kind of go into a domain that is beyond our understanding in either a spiritual, emotional, or cognitive way. And that's, that's very exciting. And when you get this relationship where you have a viewer looking at art, and that art speaks to the viewer, and then the viewer it kind of adds, like we were talking about that Gadamerian idea of adding that experience onto the larger experience of the world, you get what is called this ontological reciprocity. Basically, you and the art are communicating or you're having an experience because of this communication that you're having with this piece of art. Because again, art has its own mode of expression, its own mode of truth. All right, so... <clears throat> Of course, if we want to have an experience with art, we have to try to have an experience with art. We can't just stand in front of it and go, okay, speak to me. <laughs> we have to, or we can't just blast through an art museum or, you know, not think about art. We actually have to put some effort forth. So um, we have to be actively engaged. We have to exercise curiosity. We have to put forth effort. In many instances, it takes time. Like you can't, understand a piece of art with the 30 seconds you're looking at it. And in our fast paced world, I guarantee you standing in front of a piece of art for five minutes and only looking is probably an exercise that would challenge most of us because we're used to things just moving so much faster now. But that's not how that you can't really engender an ontological um, experience that way. Patience, it takes patience. We have to wait and see what happens. Um, we might have to put aside suspension of bias or preconceived notions. I mean, if we go into an art museum and we are we already think that abstract art is stupid and that Mark Rothko only painted scars because he didn't know how to paint anything else. And we then look at his art and go, yeah, see, it's stupid. Obviously we're not going to have an experience with that art. We have to um, exercise charity on behalf um, of art, you know, on behalf of that artist and on behalf of that piece of art and hope that it will communicate something to us that is meaningful. Um, knowledge is always helpful. Knowing a little bit about the art before you go into a museum or before you interact will always help. And just know that the more complex, abstract, and otherworldly the art is, the more demanding it is on the viewer. Um, so just because it's the same with art and literature, just because a book is difficult to understand doesn't mean the book has no value. It just means you have to work harder to understand it. And that happens with art too. But for some reason, sometimes if we don't understand a piece of art immediately, we're like, eh, we're done with it. 
Okay. But that is not being a charitable viewer. That is not waiting to see if you can have an experience with this art. All right, so that's kind of the philosophical background I wanted to give you. And now I just want to quickly go through, um, we're actually going to look at um, a couple different ways that, that art can communicate in these phenomenological ways. Um, we're going to look at Byzantine icons or Orthodox icons, which have a distinctly religious purpose. But then we're going to look at the art of Mark Rothko, which he's Jewish and um, I would say probably his art communicates spiritually rather than specifically religiously. Um, if that makes any sense, kind of can appeal to lots of different ways and to a lot of different people of faith, but still in that emotional, effective, spiritual way. We're going to look a little bit at Sean Scully, who's um, a lapsed Catholic, but whose Catholicism that touched him greatly when he grew up um, deeply affects his work. And then we'll look finally at the artist Makoto Fujimura, who is a, an abstract artist, who's an evangelical, and who is basically um, spreading the message of Christ through his art and through his activism. Um, so kind of just different angle, um, so uh, of different ways um, that um, these artists are approaching this phenomenological embodied approach to art. Um, any questions before we delve into the art itself? All good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, Byzantine icons that come from the Orthodox Catholic tradition. And um, I'll just say that Byzantine icons, um, it was a practice that was very popular until about the 1600s, and then it fell out of practice for a little while. Um, well, not a little while, several hundred centuries, and it was becoming more unusual to have a vibrant art market that produced these or even practice in religion that used these. And then around 1880, 1890, they started to become popular again, and today they are still very, very popular. Um, the ancient church is what they call the Orthodox religion. They believe they're kind of the most ancient roots <laughs> to the original apostles. Um, has been has experienced a great revival, and you can see all sorts of um, icons appearing. And the interesting thing is, is that these icons nearly always take on a very similar format as they did in the Byzantine era, era from the Middle Ages. So, for instance, I just have this example right here. This is an icon that you can buy from Etsy, like today. It's like $400. It's hand painted. It's on a wood panel and you can have it. <laughs> so it's still a practice that's being practiced today. Um, okay. I wanted to just, when we talk about icons, um, I wanted to back up just a little bit and make a differentiation between icon veneration and idol worship. Sometimes um, as in Protestant traditions or, uh, and, and Latter-day Saint um, beliefs, you know, we obviously don't believe in idol worship. And when we look, when we're outsiders looking in at Orthodox practice, we can kind of be like, what are they doing worshiping a statue or a painting? That seems really weird. But the thing is, is that they're not worshiping the painting. <laughs> it's called icon veneration, and it is not idol worship. It is not like the golden calf in the Israelites in the desert. This is not what we're talking about. It's very different than that. Um, icon veneration can seem really foreign to us, but it is indeed a sacred sacramental means of evoking the presence of the Lord. Um, it doesn't have a dual nature, but a combined nature. And this combined nature means that Orthodox practice says that if there's an icon of Christ, it is literally standing for Christ's presence. It is a tangible manifestation of Christ's presence. So it, it puts together divine and incarnational. Now, incarnational isn't a word we use a lot in our own theology, but in Protestant theology and other theologies, incarnational basically means the act of Christ taking on the body and how important that was. And we definitely believe that's important too, but we don't use that word as much. So basically it's saying the object itself, the icon is like Christ taking on that physical body. I hope that makes sense. All right. So it becomes a metaphor for Christ. 
And if you look at the Catholic and even Orthodox traditions, they very much have um, this this idea um, that doesn't divide the sacred from the secular very much at all. And they are frightfully embodied. I love this uh, quote by David Seidel at the end. He's an art historian um, uh, back East. He says, Nicene Christianity is disturbingly embodied, but it is this analogical paradigm, analogical meaning that they kind of see everything as a metaphor and not much division between the sacred and sacred sacred and secular, in which the sacramental and liturgical life of the church saturates every fiber of life that offers deeply powerful and suggestive ways of experiencing and understanding this trend in contemporary artistic practice. So what he's saying here is that this tradition um, uh, in this Catholic and Orthodox tradition, um, think about what they do. They have the doctrine of transubstantiation. So talk about disturbingly embodied. The sacrament just isn't symbolic. The sacrament, when you take it, it literally becomes, in their view, the blood and flesh of Christ. Literally, it's not symbolic. Okay, so feasting on Christ definitely has a different connotation um, for the Eucharist in this tradition. But relics, okay, um, in Catholic tradition, they believe that if you, they could touch something, they might be healed. And this goes all the way back to the New Testament when the woman touches Christ's garment and hopes to be healed from the issue of blood. Okay, they felt like objects had power to do that. And then icons also. So when you look at icons, um, this art is purposely abstracted and detached. Um, and that's because it's not supposed, and I love this quote, the purpose of this art is not to sweeten life with naturalistic depictions that would still leave the beholder in the world of decay. It is to represent the beauty of the world transfigured to reveal the human as inseparable from the divine. And so there, there's a distinct style that accompanies icons and it's a little bit formidable. It's not the... Um, some of the renditions that you see of Christ where he's sitting on a park bench with his arm around you, or he's got kids climbing all over him. It's not like that at all. It's very formal. And there's kind of, um, and a lot of times there's um, a severity to it that we're not used to in our own depictions of Christ and our own um, paradigm where we think more of Christ as a loving older brother. So it's a little bit different more of the mystery of God and the nature of God. Now, even today, if you are practicing Orthodox, you establish for yourself in your home what is called an icon corner. Usually it's in the eastern corner of your home where it faced the east. And they put pictures of um, Christ. They might also put their patron saint for their region or for their home or even for themselves. Um, it often has a platform like you can see here or a little shelf that might contain candles. Others might have a table where you have the Bible, incense, rosary beads, what have you, all the different objects that are used. And as you can see, just even in these icon corners, let alone an Orthodox church service, this is kind of appealing to a multi-sensory experience. Um, there's lots of different textures. There's light refracting on the art. Um, there's the book that you can hold. In many instances, families will gather here to sing together. And so when they worship in their homes um, using these icon corners, um, they are really practicing in kind of, a kind of embodied worship um, where they're using all their senses um, to worship. Um, so how then can icons be physically experienced? Um, this is one of the most famous icons. Um, I actually love this one. Um, this is Christ Pantocrator from the fifth century. And as you can see, um, it's a little different than a lot of more modern renditions of Christ. There is not really any sentimentality to it at all. It's, it's pretty severe. But at the same time, kind of penetrating, like it's inviting you to contemplate on his purpose. Um, so how are they physically experienced? Well, they very often had ornate frames or gold backgrounds with lots of different textures. The candles certainly help. Um, in the Middle Ages, they actually talked about a way of sensing things called extra mission, where they felt like your eyes literally sent out rays and would scan the object and then come back and tell your brain. And, and it's kind of interesting because it's kind of right, but also 
also a little bit more not right <laughs> on how the brain um, perceives things. But certainly we can, with our eyes, perceive texture. And if we see something really soft, we can imagine what that would feel like or brittle. We know what that would feel like. Um, incense appeals to smell. Very often icons were touched or kissed in the process of worship. They would sing or kneel before the icons and then often crying might accompany your meditation session or your worship session. Um, pious tears is what that's called or tears of compunction, which is what St. John of, of Chrysostom, um, Middle Ages scholar um, and theologian called what would happen. Now, um, sometimes if you look at some of the Middle Ages writers, they'll say, you know, I looked at this icon and I was struck to my heart immediately. Other times they talk about having to contemplate for a long time before the icon spoke to you. So it, it's this really interesting juxtaposition of using um, a, a material object to facilitate an ontological or a spiritual experience. Um, so Seidel, uh, the same historian I was referring to, he, he explains the icon can work on us in different ways, perhaps toward different ends. There is thus not a single meaning communicated by the image to every viewer in the same way, even though it produces as well as shapes and defines our experience. So again, wh whatever experience you have while using this visually a rich worship experience for your benefit, um, it's going to be different than the person sitting next to you. Because the res the ultimate thing, I mean, the most obvious thing, if you're looking at a piece of art, you're like, well, I'm going to contemplate maybe what Christ looks like. Well, that's not, that's not it at all. Um, Christ in these renditions is kept purposely abstracted to a certain extent. It's not as naturalistic as a depiction of a depiction. Um, but instead, it should be any number of related things that you think about Christ as you contemplate these icons. So icon veneration is an example of unique phenomenological experience that's deeply spiritually relevant infused today. And honestly, um, I think it's something that we could do as Latter-day Saints too. Um, not that we would uh, venerate icons necessarily, but certainly the church has put a lot of effort into um, having a spiritual artistic language of their own. And there are a lot of artists and perhaps um, using art in such a way as to facilitate spiritual experiences in your own study might be something that could be beneficial to you. Uh, and certainly even our Come Follow Me, you know, there's lots of pictures and pieces of art um, even in our uh, weekly lesson book. All right, um, so now we're going to move on to art that is a little bit more abstract um, in trying to have ontological reciprocity with abstract art. And I think it's interesting um, that a lot of modern artists are choosing abstraction purposely because of the potential for ontological reciprocity. They may not use those words, but when you hear them talk about the art, they're basically saying this. Um, so what are some of the reasons that artists move to abstraction? Well, one is that um, it removes viewers from the limits of time and temporality, making it possible to suspend the habits of ordinary experience. Basically, it kind of shocks you out of your everyday life and makes you think about something different. Um, some realism has been acknowledged to kind of assault viewers. If you're, if you're looking at a piece of art that's like really violent, or even if it's like based in the Bible and you know, it's, you know, how about the, the slaughter of the innocents, you know, um, Herod massacring the babies. Um, I don't know anyone who could look at that and not just kind of be, um, appalled or, 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 you know, hit with kind of the grotesque reality of that violent act. Um, and sometimes um, that, that assault on your senses or on your sensitivities even um, can make you think more about that than, than the actual um, meaning of that, of the fact that they were the very first martyrs for Christ. Okay, so you might, you might get distracted from that because you've kind of been assaulted. Um, even Aristotle notes this in his poetics. That's why he would advocate in Greek tragedy that the violence should take place off stage. He said, there's no, there's no reason to like delve into realism with both heels because all it will do is distract people with its gratuity instead of inviting the meaning of the violence. Okay. 
So um, also abstractly, abstraction is more naturally attuned to bodily perception. And it and, and while naturalistic art can more clearly communicate a certain message and can help facilitate a more direct religious experience, abstract art can open the viewer to being or to a more open-ended religious experience that might be something more uniquely tailored to you. And so these are some of the reasons why um, some people love abstraction and why some artists also create abstraction. All right, so I already talked about this quote a little bit. Um, Those who weep at my paintings have the same religious feelings I had when painting them. Um, this is Mark Rothko standing in front of his canvas. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of his biography, but he had um, he fled Europe as a small child, uh, persecuted for his Jewishness, uh, continued to be a victim of anti-Semitism in the United States, and um, created a whole body of work that is very interesting and very popular, um, but also had a very um, complica complicated, not mentally healthy adult life. Um, but um, his work still stands in for um, many of the things that he felt as he, as he would um, make his art. So um, probably the most obvious thing with Rothko is his use of color. Now he would get frustrated. You can read in this biography in the book his son wrote about him. Christopher Rothko wrote a great book about his dad. You can, he, he didn't wanna be known as a colorist. Instead, he felt that color was a way to communicate with other people. And maybe you've noticed that color speaks to you. I, I hope you've noticed this. If you're an artist, is there a color that you just love, okay, that really speaks to you? Or you find yourself overwhelmed by color even sometimes. A lot of artists can even see more colors than the average person. Did you know that? They can differentiate more colors. So um, Rothko felt that basically color had been diluted over time. If you look back to the Middle Ages and even Greek and Roman statuary, they used really, really bright, what we would call garish colors, um, even on in, in cathedrals and things like that, but they've kind of faded over time. And then when we get to the Renaissance, they did more um, sophisticated mixing of pigment so that we had more gradation and color. But he felt like mixing those colors um, kind of negated the impact of color. And he said, even like the Impressionists where they're using art just squished right out of the tube, pure pigment, as pure as you can get in that format. But if they are painting different colors in pro close proximity to each other, when you stand back, they optically mix and kind of have a graying effect. So he wanted to avoid this and have pure color be able to speak to viewers. So he ground his own paints. He often went back to yoke as a binder like temperate paints. And then he would apply the paint in multiple thin glazes. This is really similar to, um, you know, how the Grand Masters painted in multiple thin glazes. So the technique is not dissimilar in some ways and even grinding his own paint, you know, his own pigment and everything. So other physical elements that you see when you encounter a Rothko painting, they're huge, okay? And he often had very specific details on how they should be displayed in a museum. He wanted them in a certain proximity to each other, and he didn't want their impact diluted with other pieces in between. And when you go see um, a lot of Rothko's, this has been true. Like if you go to the Tate in England, there's a Rothko room. It's just a whole room of only Rothko. And there's a Rothko room I'll show you here in just a second in Washington, D.C. So those were his specifications. Um, you can also see visible breath strokes, especially at the fuzzy Rothko edge. Um, if you look at a Rothko long enough, the, the rectangles he paints on top often have this kind of disembodied floating effect that he managed to, uh, to obtain. And then of course, there's no frame on a Rothko. The, the canvas goes right to the edge and then it's just placed directly on the wall. And so these are some of the ways, again, that he emphasizes the physicality of his work with the presence, with the color, with the saturation, with all of those things. Um, but at the same time, um, when people contemplate his works, they very often find that they have a moving experience. And sometimes they're really surprised by this moving experience. And I can say that this has happened to me, um, that giving myself over to it, if you will, 
has landed in some very has resulted in some very moving experiences that I have personally had um, with a Rothko painting. Now, obviously, I'm showing you a projection on this from my computer, and it's being put on your screen in a different room. You're, it's not going to happen, okay? Because you really do have to see the actual physical object, I think, especially with the Rothko, it's just so diluted um, through, you know, putting it through pictures and things like that. You're missing a lot of that physical experience. But here is a picture. I, I got this with my daughter. Um, we got the Rothko room all to ourselves last time we were in DC. Um, and it's just a really beautiful room. And here's a close up I took of that Rothko edge where you can kind of see all the gradations of color. You can see the brush strokes a little distinctly and it gets that kind of floating effect. Um, really very beautiful. Um, and so Rothko really, he did try and communicate. Um, and, and, you know, I could have a whole lecture just on Rothko and all the ways he's trying to do this. Um, but instead I'll just give you another sampling. And this is Sean Scully. He's maybe not as well known by Roth as Rothko, but he's very influenced by Rothko. Um, Sean Scully uh, is also a writer, and so his writings are absolutely fantastic, and he's been a favorite lecturer at colleges and stuff, so I have several of his books that include his writings, and he's just wonderfully expressive. Um, he grew up in Ireland, and he um, was very, very poor, and because of his poverty, sadly, he ended up having some very sad interactions with the Catholic Church um, both in Ireland and then later in London when he moved there, that kind of turned him off to, re to organize religion. And it's really sad to hear because he was deeply touched by religion as a child, but through a series of very uncharitable acts by imperfect people kind of didn't see much use for it. And I'm sure you know people where this has happened, um, where their um, religious associations get diluted because of bad experiences. But his religion and his our spirituality, if you will, continues to be present in his works. Um, and he said, an artist who can provoke empathy is the one who simply completed your thought and makes visible our desires, yours and mine. I'm not trying to say anything different from what you want to say. I want to say the same thing. He's mostly known for stripes. That is what he is mostly known for. Um, and again, his art has a really strong physical presence. They're large, like you just saw. They have unexpected, irregular forms. They have stripes that layer with really bright juxtapositions of color and really um, often um, aggressive brushstrokes. And then the stripes jut against each other in different ways. Sometimes he takes smaller canvases and puts them together like a puzzle. So the literal canvas is broken up into several different pieces. Um, and he switched to oil purposely because it was more embodied. <laughs> he said, I could feel it more. It exudes my presence. And you really can kind of schlep on those oils. You can make the impasto technique, you know, just thicker, more presence. And that's what he wanted. Um, and here he says too, abstractions, the art of our age. It's a breaking down of certain structures and opening up. It allows you to think without making oppressively specific references so that the viewer is free to identify with the work. Abstract art has the possibility of being incredibly generous, really out there for everybody. It's a non-denominational religious art. It is the spiritual art of our time. Um, so that's what he feels about abstraction. And um, here's one of his works. Um, like Rothko and even Barnett Newman, by the way, they all did series of Stations of the Cross, but they did them in abstract ways. Um, he did one too. So it has 15 total paintings, 14 plus one. 14 is usually typical. Barnett Newman's has 15 as well. Um, but they're Stations of the Cross. And this one is named Holly after his mother, who is a very, very devout Catholic, but then who also was so hurt over the treatment she had um, that, that she had like a huge faith crisis and it hurt her and tore her apart and all these kinds of things. And so he's very sensitive to this. Um, and so this is named after his mother. And he says, there is, however, another human impulse and need that is also constant, and that is the need for abstraction which I believe is bound up with the need for spiritual ecstasy. I believe that there is an abstract rhythm and structure that runs parallel to all life and that unconsciously binds us together. 
So he's someone who's really thought about why he uses abstraction and why abstraction for him communicates in a spiritual way. Um, all right, that brings us to our last artist. Um, and I'm hoping I'm introducing you to people maybe you haven't heard of before. Makoto Fujimura is absolutely hands down one of my favorite artists. His stuff is absolutely stunning. Um, and he is a wonderful writer. He's written several wonderful books. I just saw that he just published one in January. It's in my Amazon cart now. It's called Art and Faith. Um, Fujimura is known for uh, Japanese Nihonga painting, but he's got a really interesting way that he got there because he lived in Japan, came to the United States, spoke English, American teenager, not religious family at all, goes back to Japan because he gets um, a scholarship to study Japanese painting at the Tokyo Art Institute and um, finds out that his ancestry involves some of the first Christians in Japan, was super moved and converts to Christianity. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting way that he got there. Um, but he has then taken this combination of his influence from the abstract expressionists, Rothko and Gorky especially, were his um, uh, kind of favorite abstract expressionist artists with Japanese Nihonga painting. And then he brings this Christianity to it too. So this really wonderful combination um, of all of these things. He's bilingual um, and he speaks Japanese and obviously English. He is very active in his own church um, in New York City. And his wife is actually... Catholic, Irish Catholic, and he is Protestant. So <laughs> he's just got a whole lot of uh, mixing going on in his life. And he is a wonderful advocate for um, how Christians should care about and care for culture. He says, a culture of fear has never produced great culture. We do not create great art in response to fear and anxiety. We create great art by loving culture, loving the materials and stories from which we create art. We create great art by having faith to love our neighbors as ourselves and even love our enemies. So great. He's a great missionary for art and Christianity. Now here's a Japanese Nihonga painting. If you're not familiar with this, um, they make it out of pulverized minerals. And he often does his own pulverizing with the mortar and pestle himself, coral and shells. They then mix that with glue and water. And then they apply it in very, very thin layers, minimum of 60 often 80 to 100 layers. And this is not acrylic. It does not dry quickly. It takes a very long time. So he says, you literally watch your own paint dry. <laughs> it's what he says. It takes a very long time. And then you apply it to handmade paper, which he also makes himself. Okay. So this takes months. He also uses silk to reference his Japanese heritage, but then gold to reference his Christianity. And he uses gold very similarly to how medieval painters would use it to reference like a golden city or, or spiritual things or places. Okay, so this is what a couple quotes from him. He says, my art reaches for the heavenly reality, reality via earthly materials. So do you see how it's this great combination of ontic and ontological? The intuitive core of my creativity, like the shepherd's hearts drawn to the birth of the Savior, simply desires to pay homage to the mystery of the moment. Lest we miss the birth of the Savior, lest we fail to glimpse the glory of heaven hidden beneath the earth. The spirit, though, can help to open all of our eyes to see the extraordinary in the ordinary, whether the material be extravagant minerals or a blackboard, whether we're watching an artist at work or observing a special needs child. Um, and then he basically wants people to transcend through his art. There's this great story where uh, David Brooks, who's a friend of his and a New York uh, columnist, he's a conservative columnist that does a lot of op-eds for the New York Times. He's friends with Fujimura. And he said, he tells his own story. It was a great article in the New York Times where he goes to Fujimura's apartment and wants to have an experience with his art. But Fujimura is like, no, you have to actually sit and look at it for like 10 to 12 minutes. And after Brooks did that, he was able to facilitate that kind of experience and was deeply spiritual for him. But the thing with the Nihonga layers is that by using that ground minerals and shells um, and doing all the thin layers, it starts to refract light in between the layers 
you don't notice it until you look at it for a long time. And then all of a sudden the surface just shimmers and glows in ways because of the materials that he's used. He says, I want to affirm and celebrate the physical. This sacramental language must address reality and confront what we see, but must transcend it to grasp what we can't see yet. Therefore, I use precious minerals, gold and silver on delicate handmade Japanese paper to affirm and celebrate the physical with sacramental language. Okay, so he's combining that physical. Um, I'm a little short on time, so I might not do this quote, but I do want to do this one. I see abstraction as a potential language to speak to today's world about the hope of things to come. And for the follower of Christ who is making art to the glory of God, isn't this potential exciting? I believe that in many ways, spiritual qualities and ideas can be more readily accessible in abstraction than they would be in representational art, where renderings of familiar things often carry within conceptual baggage. This baggage can mislead or even prohibit the viewer from moving further up and further in to the spiritual which the artwork points. So that is why he chooses abstraction. And I would encourage you to take a look at his stuff. It's just stunning. Mineral pigments, gold and platinum on kumahata paper. <laughs> okay, special paper. Oyster shell, gold on Belgian linen. Um, and he also created um, a, an illuminated Bible. So that is my presentation on um, phenomenology, abstract art, and spirituality, and icons. Thank you for coming.